We're uh, joined now in studio by two special guests. We heard from Coach Kelly Church a few weeks ago, but he's back in studio and with a special guest, QJ Peterson, former Hedgesville basketball player, spent time with the Knicks this summer in the Summer League and had a tremendous finish to the Summer League. How are you doing, QJ? I'm doing well, guys. How about yourselves? Doing well. Thanks for coming in. As uh, I heard you were in the panhandle this week, and I was like, this is perfect. Yeah. We were going to have you on via phone, but uh, the fact that you're here is perfect. You got your daughter with you. Yeah, she's a little wild child, but love her death. <laughs> Thank you guys for having us. Coach Church uh, helped yeah. set it up, and, uh, you know, he's one of your former players, but I- I'm assuming you're, he's a he's a good friend of yours now as well. Yeah, uh, obviously, like, uh, you know, over the course of time, you try to stay in touch with as, as many players as you can. And uh, I often come on, and when I am, I, I talk about the relationships, uh, far more important than the basketball part of it. And QJ's had a very special journey, and, you know, I feel blessed just to, to be part of it. And, you know, I uh, basketball camp last night, I did the, the Parks and Rec basketball camp, and I talked about QJ a little bit. And, uh you know, I, I didn't help QJ be able to touch the top of the white box. Uh, I, I didn't help him with some of his God-given talents. What I what I do think I helped him with is learning how to, to, to work really hard and be a good person and everything else. And along the way, uh, you know, our relationship has, has grown and stayed solid all the way through when he first went to prep school and then at VMI. Uh, it's not the easiest school, I'm sure he can tell you, to, to go to. Um, you know, and then, you know, all along the way, his professional career. Uh, sometimes sometimes QJ doesn't know the time difference between China and America, I think, sometimes when I get a <laughs> <laughs> when I get a late night phone call, but uh, yeah, we're 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 certainly we've become pretty. You know, obviously we were close all the way through, but mm-hmm. but we've remained that way. I think. Yeah, for sure, for sure. It's a uh, it's been a love love relationship. No real love hate. Um, <laughs> you know, I know he's always in my corner, always there uh, whenever I need him. So, um, you know, it's it's very important to have somebody like that in your life. Uh, I grant I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for him. Um, you know, I, I tell people this all the time, and I tell my wife this all the time. Like, you know, Kelly Church never asked me for money. He's never asked me to do, you know, anything, right? But he's always been like that second father figure to me, um, and he always will be. You know, with, without him and uh, him teaching me how to be a good person, it, like forget the basketball stuff for, for a minute. He, I knew he was going to help me basketball wise, but you know, being a being a good person both on and off the court, um, you know that that's gotten me a, a long way than basketball ever will. Uh, so you know, I can't I can't thank him enough for essentially saving my life um, and you know helping me you know provide for my family. So so yeah. QJ, thanks for uh, joining us today. Just talk us through, I guess, your journey starting Hedgesville to VMI and now playing everywhere around the world for basketball. Um, so from Hedgesville, should I even tell him about the story? And uh, how long and you were there before what? you? Before you? Uh, how long? Like you're at Mass Nutton for a week. Before before the VMI, so I'm gonna tell oh, you. Oh man! So QJ didn't. QJ wanted to go like right to college. He didn't necessarily want to go to prep school. Yeah. Uh, I knew the guys at, at VMI pretty well, and I'm like, guys, look, he's 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 good enough. He's he's easily good enough to play in your league. He's going to be a really really good player. I think he's better than your league. You should get him now. And uh, you know, uh, they, well, we really really want him to go to prep school first. So they had him go to prep school. He was at prep school for a week. And then they offered him because they watched him. You know, he went there and he played. And they went into one of their workouts at Massanutten. And, and um, you know, they offered him right away. Mm. So that was a little frustrating for him, I know. But uh, I mean, it was and wasn't. It was just, you know, I committed early because that was the only offer that I had. And I was like, well, I'm going to go ahead and take it. And, you know, like the Clemsons, the Wake Forest, the Virginia Tech, they all come back and they all say, like, while VMI offers, it was like, um, you're not a Division One player, um, or if so, then you're a low Division One guy. And then they all come back in December and they wanted me to decommit and, you know, sign with one of them. I was like, well, just two months ago, I wasn't a Division One player. So I don't know where that happened, but I ended up staying with VMI, um, you know, played three and a half years there and you know 
he was at my very first college game. He was at my graduation. He was at my ring figure ceremony. Um, he was at my senior night. Um, he was there when we played Richmond the first game my senior year. Um, you know, he's just, he's been there all the way through. But, um, but yeah, so VMI was, VMI was crazy. Uh, it's kind of one of those situations where you fake it till you make it, but then once you make it, you become a better person uh, out of it. And I think, and I think truth be told, if it wasn't for VMI, if it wasn't having to go through, you know, those hardships and um, trials and tribulations there, I probably wouldn't have survived playing overseas. A lot of guys don't survive playing overseas because they, you know, they, you know, it's tough living overseas by yourself. It's tough playing, you know, basketball and the language barrier and trying to do things that they want you to do because, you know, the minute that they feel like you don't, do what they want you to do like they just send you off so you know being able to follow directions being disciplined to, to get to practice and games on times like all that stuff matters it's huge it's huge over there um and a lot of guys don't end up making it over there because the culture and lifestyle is just totally different and they they haven't had that discipline all their life like they've been almost catered to all their life like as if everything is gonna be waiting on them and come to find out like they're getting ready to bring the next guy in because they're not doing you know some of the small things it may not be the basketball talent part but it's the other small things that gets a lot of guys cut over there so um just that military structure it's really really you know helped me go a long way overseas wise so I'm curious to hear more about your time overseas. Uh, how how does the style of play in the the leagues over in China compare to what you played in before? And mm-hmm. how does the you know culture and just day to day living over there compare to you know when you've been over here? Mm-hmm. So China is uh, it's a whole lot different than you know Europe because sometimes in Europe you get you get people who um, know how to uh, speak English in Europe sometimes. Um, China's, China's, see, it's tough because China's league, you can only have two, maybe three Americans, but only one can play at a time. But sometimes you'll have really good Chinese players, like you'll play against some of the national team guys. um, And those guys are pretty good. Um, But in terms of competition-wise, it it doesn't really compare to Europe um, because you have a lot of, you know, ex-NBA guys who can play, like, you know, you have two and three guys out there on the court that are American, so it, may, it brings the talent up, of course. And and uh, and so just, you know, with the rules, like if China wanted to be, become more competitive, they could possibly add more Americans. And, you know, and then I think it would, it would go up. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> but Turkey, Turkey was definitely, um, was another league that... Uh, whose competition level was extremely high because they have, um, you know, like I said, three, four, five, six Americans per team um, who've, like, all played in the NBA. At some point in time, they've played in the NBA, and then they came came to Turkey or they came to Spain, and they've they've played. So... um, So in that aspect, it's kind of different, just the... You know the rules, so to say. That's that's what really changes everything is the rules. Like, um, but like mainly overseas, you you don't have defensive three seconds, whereas the NBA you you don't. Um, or sorry, you do in the NBA, at which it kind of spreads the floor yeah. in the NBA. The the floor is a whole lot bigger, and I understand now why why a lot of teams don't want six foot guards because solely on the defensive end when you. You know, when you have a six foot guard and, and and help side trying to recover that far distance to your man is, is more difficult than, you know, having a six three guy with a six seven, six eight wingspan. Um, it's a little bit easier. But, you know, it, it definitely can be done. Um, just with energy and effort, like I said. Um but I think that's just the real big difference is, is just the rules, so to say. When you were over there, was your family with you? In China? Yeah. 
Uh, no, huh? Yeah. The okay. uh, COVID, the COVID situation over there was a little crazy. They, we were pretty much in a bubble. The first, um, we were in the bubble from the beginning of October to the end of October, and then we had a month off. Then we were back into a bubble. Uh, December to um, to January like 19th or something like that and then the last phase um, we went home in a way that's because they lifted COVID restrictions but it was it was in the bubble situation we were going from the hotel to practice or hotel to game and that was it um, we couldn't go out go out like anywhere else we could we could walk around the outside of the hotel they had it like blocked off and so, you know, but some some guys were going crazy in there. Uh, and so eventually they they just relift. They just lifted the COVID restrictions over there. And um, and of course, there was a spike. There was a COVID spike, which yeah. we knew was going to happen. But um, now it's a little bit easier to have family, you know, come over now and whatnot. And it just depends where you are in China. Yeah. Um, What's uh, What was that call like when you talked with your agent? I know you kind of wrote about it on that post that you made, that you're going to get this opportunity with the Knicks, that you were going to get the opportunity with the Knicks for Summer League. Um, you know, he just was straightforward with me. He just said, look, like, they want you for Summer League, but the, the deal is that they don't know how much you're going to play. You probably won't play till the last game. And... Um, and, you know, that you, they understand that you have offers on the table. If you don't want to do it, they understand. Um, but if they if you do want to do it, then we don't want to have like calls every day, like with your agent and why you're not playing and and things like that. And so so I was just like, well, I've already came this far. It's my first ever summer league. I probably won't get another chance at this because because I'm 28 years old and um and you know they want younger guys so it it took me a little while like it was a tough pill to swallow and i was just like look like i'm just gonna you know make it extremely hard for them not to not to play me um i'm gonna work extremely hard when i get there i'm gonna you know communicate be the best leader both on and off the court as much as possible and i'm gonna help these young guys whether that whether i see a minute or 40 minutes like it's not my my attitude and demeanor is not going to change, um, and so I told I told him to tell them like that's my response. And then you know when I get there for practice, um, you know they pretty much have me on like the third string, or whatever. The guys are probably not going to play in the game, um, and <laughs> and so practice begins, and I'm killing the guys that are you know projected to play. I can't and get so, enough of watching you. And so, uh, and so, you know, we're competing and my team is actually winning and, he, and they're like, okay, like, and, and they start kind of looking around like, okay, we, we see what's going on, but, you know, I just kept it all in perspective. Like, it's still practice. Like, you know, just, just compete. No matter what, just compete. I'm like, they they may say one thing and you know a coach could easily be like he could he could help us win we got to put him in the game type of deal um and so and so you know the first two games kind of go by um and the loudest one out there like even though guys are on the floor playing you know i'm talking louder than them telling them where they are in position and you know coach is looking at me you know on the bench like Felt like he's into it. He sees the game more better than them. But you know, thank you. Um, but um, so they've seen that for two games, right? And they seen me, you know, co coaching Trevor Keels up a little bit, Jalen Martin, two two guys who are 19 years old that are on two ways right now with the Knicks and trying to help them out and understand the game a little bit better. Here, sorry. Talk and uh, Don't apologize, man. <laughs> and. Uh, and so they they really see me like take the young guys like under under their under my wing and kind of show them like look like you know this this will help you out there and just help them understand the game better and then just whenever you know I got I got out there in the third game it was really just 
try to change the dynamic of the game, the way the game was going, just provide that spark off the bench, uh, you know, by any means necessary, you know, just diving on the floor for loose balls. Like, even though I may not get it, I'm still going to dive after it because you never know. Like, yeah. so whether it seems like it might be out of my reach, if I dive, I might be able to tip it, hit it off his foot or something, and we still get the ball back. Or there's a chance I might actually get the ball and we get extra possession. You know, so it's just, um, it just played with a lot of energy and that effort, uh, that third game. I mean, granted, I'm a natural scorer, so it's going to happen. Like, yeah. you know, as long as I just take good shots and don't try to force anything, the, the scoring will, the scoring will come. Um, but scoring wasn't, wasn't really even my focus like those games out there it, it was you know playing defense playing with a lot of energy and effort and providing us with a spark um off the bench and you know game to game your role changes uh, i try to get people to understand this all the time like if you're a scorer and that's your job right um and you don't have a game where you're scoring the best what else are you going to do to you know help help affect the game you know because there's 20 other ways to to affect the game and and so i try to i try to tell guys this all the time i know they say i know a lot of times guys say oh i didn't have a good game i didn't have a good game because they maybe didn't shoot well i was like well if that's the case i didn't have a good game the first two games of summer league because you know i shot six of 19 one game with two of nine from three and the second game i shoot like two of eight and over four from three right but you know the first game i did it on the defensive end grabbing nine rebounds six assists right and just the energy was different getting guys to communicate on defense was different every time i was out there i affected i affected the game in a positive way um in the same way for the second game i, I tell the guys like let that energy from the first game translate over to the second game, you you guys know you guys now know how hard you need to play and with the energy that you need to play with in order to win games in the NBA, um, and they and they took it and they ran with it. You know they they essentially came out the gate and got up twenty fast. So for me as a point guard, all I gotta do is keep that energy and effort up, regardless of whether I'm making or missing shots. And I just gotta manage the game, make sure we're getting good shots on the on the offensive end, and make sure we're we're you know, finishing the defensive possession with a rebound on the defensive end. That that's it. That's that's all I had to do for that game. Um, and of course, you know, the third game, you know, uh, I play a whole lot more, of course. And and so, you know, my coach wanted me to score, of course, and you know, kind of going only having thank thank you having having to uh, only score only eight points in the first you know three quarters. And I could have easily like hung my head. We were down by 13, whatever. We're like, we're still in the game. Like, yeah. The game is still manageable. Like we're good. So I'm still staying positive throughout, encouraging guys, you know, confidence never wavers. And, you know, I just tell myself, I tell my coaches and teammates, I'm like, look, I'm about to step up in the fourth quarter. Like, I don't know what's going to happen, but we're going to come back and we're probably, we're going to, you know, have a chance of winning this game. Um, and so that just kind of inspired the 17.4th quarter for me that just staying positive whole time, the whole time. I think it was just um, God just, I feel like, re reward me, um, you know, for having such a good attitude this whole experience, like this whole time in Vegas. Um, it just kind of all came together, like, just in that one moment. And even though I missed those last three shots like at the end to either win it or tie it up or whatever um yes it matters to me but yeah. you know the the big picture was you know we competed we fought to the end and we still had a chance at winning the game so um but that but that Vegas experience I'll never forget it's definitely one you know that I'll always cherish and you know whether I make it to the league or not that's it at this point, it doesn't matter. As long as this little one's happy and taken care of, that's all I can really care about. Isn't that right? Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what is, uh, I guess, the feedback been? Any word for um, I anything even, after I summer? I haven't even messaged my agent yet about it. I was, you know, giving him, like, the end of the week and just see what he hears from teams. Um, while I was out there in Vegas, the... Um, 
one of the higher up guys with the with the Knicks. You know, he told me before that last game, he's like, look, like you've turned a lot of eyes here at Summer League just solely off of your your energy and effort and showing how like you've been playing like your life depended on it and just how everything matters. Like even though it's the last game and you probably not gonna make the playoffs, like everything's mattered to you. Um, just keep keep showing that. Keep showing uh, that you're leading guys, huddling huddling guys up when there's free throws, and you know just you know just keep being a leader. And you know he he told me that. Uh, <laughs> he told me that uh, you know just you know the Nuggets have been watching and a few other teams have been watching and asking about me and stuff like that and. Um, it was actually pretty good. It was a good thing that I had a good game against the Nuggets. Uh, that that helped a little bit, but um, I mean, we'll just have to wait and see. It's it's. Uh, I guess I, I mean I don't know if it's necessarily early, but they're doing their whole roundup now yeah. and and figuring things out. 